<clears throat> All right, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar today. Uh, today's topic will be the CIS critical controls. Uh, we're going to start uh, looking at, we're going to look at the top five controls today. Uh, these controls are really what you can use to build a foundation uh, for cybersecurity within your organization. As always, as always, I have Lee Kennedy with us today. Uh, he'll be uh, helping me uh, with this topic. Him and I both have a lot of experience working with the CIS critical controls. We've been uh, using them for at least what about two years now, uh, you know, to help guide our own organization, but also use them in our uh, risk assessments that we uh, perform for other organizations. Um, as always, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please feel free to enter those in uh, into the Q&A area in the Zoom meeting, and we'll try to get those answered for you either uh, online with the uh, presentation or at the end of it. Uh, looking at today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about risk to your organization, some of the, uh, the hot items that are out there, some of the trends that we're seeing uh, with uh, cybersecurity and the risk associated with uh, being online. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what are the CIS critical controls. Uh, we'll cover the top five critical controls, which are controls one through five, which is really uh, the foundation for which you can use to build your own uh, cybersecurity program. And then talk about, well, how do you get started with this? And of course, Q&A at the end. So uh, let's go and get started. Uh, we think about what are the, the major risks out there, and uh, Lee, there's are three that I came up with that I know that we are, are consistently seeing uh, in our, I guess, ecosystem regarding managed services and some of the clients that we work with, also some of the sources of information. Uh, I think uh, top of the list seems to be, are continuing to be uh, the proliferation of ransomware. I know we've seen a couple of uh, Issues with that across a couple places. Lee, what are some that you know of that, that have happened? I know you've been involved in a couple of them, but also know some others that are out there that have happened recently. Yeah, you know, the the gateway for ransomware, I would say at least 80% of the time is your second bullet point, the phishing. The yes. phishing is the gateway to um to these ransomware attacks. I wouldn't say all of them, but the majority of them, uh, you know, they're picking on the end users. Yeah, I know we've seen a couple of uh, ransomware attacks profiled in different news stories lately. Uh, here locally in Alabama, I know that uh, we saw uh, Florence, uh, the city of Florence, which is one of the municipalities uh, in sort of the northeast corner got hit with ransomware, and it started with a phishing attack. It started with uh, someone getting their uh, their credentials compromised. Uh, I think it was actually maybe even an IT manager up there from what I read. Uh, but uh, that goes along with sort of the first bullet point. We're seeing a lot of uh, increased attacks on municipalities right now uh, simply because, uh, you know, the malicious actors out there know that uh, a lot of times they are uh, understaffed in that area, but also know uh, with, uh, you know, the, the sources of revenue are cut right now and, Therefore, they don't have the time and effort to invest in protecting their organizations. I uh, want to talk a little bit about ransomware as a service. Uh, this is a real thing. Uh, so if you're a, uh, you don't have to be really, really uh, technical to actually deploy ransomware. So if you want to uh, purchase it, uh, you can easily get on to certain websites and actually uh, purchase ransomware and deploy it. So uh, the deployment and access to ransomware is, uh, becoming a lot easier, uh, even for those who are non-technical. So imagine, just like any as a service you get now, imagine if you could, you can go out and purchase it, get support for it, and also uh, be able to deploy it uh, with minimal technical assistance. So I was reading an article on this even just today about what a problem it is now becoming, uh, you know, for uh, many, uh, or how easy it is to actually get your hands on it. And, uh, and easily deploy it out uh, to, into, to uh, networks you may have access to or to targets that you may uh, come in contact with. So this is uh, becoming a bigger issue uh, as they try to make money at it. This is really what it's about. Uh, publication of victim files, this is sort of a new trend. Uh, I wouldn't say new, but it's definitely a, a trend we have seen uh, recently 
in the past, ransomware has really been focused on encryption. So that means that once the, uh, the malicious software downloads, um, it starts encrypting files. We've seen this happen, uh, you know, numerous times in different situations we've worked. And, and often it happens very quickly. You don't have a whole lot of time to react. Uh, you can use, lose thousands of files in just a matter of minutes. Yep. Uh, but now we're also seeing not only are the files encrypted, but they'll actually, actually exfiltrate the data. Uh, we saw this happen in Florence, which is one I mentioned before, but uh, it's not only did they encrypt the files in the backup, but they took that data and said, hey, we're going to publish all this sensitive data uh, for either your clients, could be your employees, uh, online. Uh, and that way it can be used in different other types of attacks. So we're seeing this pivot around, not just, hey, we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, not only uh, encrypt your files and deny you access to that, but we're also going to take whatever data we can and we're going to publish it out. And that becomes part of the ransom. So that's a, a new twist or a new uh, vector we've seen happen with ransomware. And we also see ransoms have increased. I think yeah. we first started seeing ransomware come out was what, maybe a couple grand, three, four thousand dollars Now we're seeing some uh, victims pay, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. And, yeah. Uh, Lee, what are your thoughts on that? Why is that happening, you think? Well, I got to comment on the publication part. You know, they the reason the, the bad guys are doing that is because a lot of places, you know, an easy solution to ransomware is a good backup, off-site backup. Mm -hmm. You restore Absolutely. it. Guess what? You know, they did all this work. They got on your environment. They encrypted your files. Guess what they get out of it? Absolutely nothing because you had a backup. So they're, they got to do more than just... Um, you know, encrypt your files because that's not, they're not benefit from that. So that they can steal the data and encrypt it, kind of play both games and then threaten you with the release of sensitive information. There you go. Now, now, now you, even if you do have a good backup, you're considering paying the ransom to, to, you know, cover, cover your tail from this stuff being released to the public. Yeah. I mean, we still, we still recommend our clients one of the best defenses against ransomware is a good backup and, and not just a backup that you have on site connected to your network, but you got to have one completely off site, completely disconnected from your network. Uh, that is really the only true protection from a backup perspective. Cause we've seen too many times where, uh, you know, when people infiltrate a network, they will do their recon, they will find your backups, and then when they drop the ransomware, it will actually encrypt your backups as well. So. What's, what's the statistic, Brian? When, when you get, when somebody gets on your network, uh, what, how long do they hang out there before they actually make a move? Uh, probably long enough to be paying rent. So you're talking probably, <laughs> you know, 160 days on yeah. average is what we're seeing, uh, right. you know, or what we've seen as a, a published statistic that they will, uh, you know, just uh, to take residence on your network. So, you know, this usually is not just a drive-by scenario. They are usually yeah. there and there for quite a while. Uh, yeah. They're going to learn your business, learn how you connect business, and learn uh, different sources of information and, and where all your uh, devices are on the network. So, yeah. and keep, uh, it, keep in mind, too, these guys have time on their hands. You know. They do. They are very yeah. patient. They are definitely very patient. Uh, business email compromise this is still a, a major threat that we're still seeing a problem with. Stealing your credentials, committing financial fraud. Uh, you know, we're big proponents of education of users so they can identify and also mitigate risk against phishing emails. Uh, still yeah. biggest threat vector, uh, without a doubt. Yeah, and there's no stopping it. There's no tool out there that can stop it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's there. The only way to do your best attempt at stopping it is educate yourself and be able to recognize it. And other than that, they're, they're out there and there's no way to stop them. Yes. And that it is that we, we, you know, we have pretty high level email security. We have our stuff logged in. We still get phishing emails. I still get voicemails from people I don't know. I still get, yeah. uh, you know, requests for, for different types of logins or alerts for Office 365. Uh, so, uh, this is something you always just have to be on guard with. And then finally, uh, the COVID-19 scams have really picked up. I've seen several FBI uh, notifications and, and pins about the different types of scams, both uh, the healthcare scams. Hey, we've got a cure. Hey, we've got a remedy for it. You know, click here, provide your information to buy something that could be a scam. 
but also the financial side related to the PPP loans, related to uh, the different types of stimulus programs. I got one just the other day that said, hey, your stimulus check is waiting, uh, related to COVID-19, and obviously that was uh, fake uh, and, and, and a, a pretty good looking phishing scam. So. Uh, you know, as you're as you're going about your daily uh, business uh, on your computer, uh, be very aware of what you're clicking on, uh, and make sure that if you do, uh, you know, surmise there's a problem or recognize, hey, get in touch with your IT group uh, so they can help you mitigating your risk about yeah. it. So and keep in just, mind too, the government's not going to send you an email. No, know. they <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> They're not going to send an email. Generally, yeah. they they don't don't conduct any kind of business via email, including uh, the IRS. Uh, or the Department <laughs> of Treasury, they don't like to use email. Now, if so, they show up at your door, that's a different story. But yeah, I don't think I want to show up my door anytime soon. <laughs> Usually, if they do that, it's not to give you a stimulus check. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's let's talk about sales critical control. So uh, for those of you who may be, uh, you know on the video, on the webinar today that may not know what the CI's critical controls are, we're gonna talk a few minutes about how and uh, who uh, supports them. So uh, they were created and maintained by the Center for Internet Security. This is a, a non-for-profit body uh, that is out there and is setting standards, helping people become more secure. Uh, their, web, their website is up there. They've got some great resources uh, online that you can uh, pull up and take a look at. Uh, just uh, related to uh, you know, different types of uh, security. So I'll pull up their, their here, uh, look up their website here. They've got a lot of great, uh, you know, resources out here related to security. They've got benchmarks. They've got the controls, of course. But I highly recommend that you go out there and take a look at that site to get more information. But, but they're the ones that come up with the critical controls. They're the ones that maintain them. Uh, the there's only 20 of them. So which that's one thing that I think is an advantage of this is, uh, you know, when you start looking at NIST or ISO or even HIPAA, the standards are very deep. They're very broad. And I think a bit overwhelming for a lot of small business and small business owners when it comes to uh, implementing a good cybersecurity practice. So, uh, however, they do map to those other standards. So, uh, so if you do have, if you do look at the top 20 controls, uh, there is a document that is published by CIS that will allow you to map each top 20 control and any sub controls underneath those to those standards. Uh, they represent the essential best practices that your organization can implement to improve their cybersecurity postures. So this is a list of 20 best practices uh, that you can uh, begin to look at and begin to implement in your, uh, your company. They're prioritized. So that's one reason we're just going to cover the top five today because these represent, represent the top five priorities you should have in your organization to protect it from uh, the different vectors that are out there. And statistically speaking, if you can properly implement these top five controls, you can prevent 85% uh, uh, of the co most common cyber attacks that are out there. That's a big number, Lee, 85% just by doing five things. Yeah, and when we get into the details of the top five, you'll come to find out they're not that complicated. They're easy to implement for the most part. Yes, and I'll say when we do security assessment, we concentrate a lot of our time in these top five. And usually uh, when it comes down to most of the recommendations we make to clients are represented in this top five. Right. Uh, they really are. And, uh, you know, whether, and we'll go over those and, and talk of those in a little more detail. So let's just jump right into it. I sort of grouped these two together, Lee. Uh, control one and two, uh, yep. inventory and control of hardware assets, inventory control of software assets. You got to know what you're protecting. You know, uh, if you don't know what you're protecting, you're losing because you're not protecting yeah. at that point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as you go out there, you know, and you look at your network and, and what's on, what are the hardware assets on your environment? Uh, too many times we, we can, when we've actually worked with clients, you know, we'll do a physical inventory of, of their different devices and we'll ask them, hey, what does this do? And they have no idea. They have no idea it was on there. We'll go out and do a scan and uh, we'll find a switch or an access point or we'll find a device and yeah. – they, they don't know what it does or why it's even there. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, or should it even be on the network? We see 
HVAC control systems, yes. uh, camera systems, uh, you, you name it. Uh, it really shouldn't be on their network at all because they're, they're typically very vulnerable and you'll do, we'll get into vulnerability scanning later, but they will light up a vulnerability scan, but there's no way to resolve them. There's no firmware updates for these devices. There's no, you know, patches written for them. So the best practice there is to don't even put them on your network. You can have them, but separate them from your, you know, corporate network. Yeah. And a lot of times uh, some devices are unauthorized and right. uh, maybe unmanaged devices. You know, uh, you'll have, uh, you know, these types of IOT devices or switches or something put on the network. They're not authorized. They're not inventory. And uh, not only those can, can those represent vulnerabilities, but to your point, if you don't know what you have to protect, it's hard to protect it. So same thing with software. Uh, you've got to be able to actively manage all the software on your network. Only authorized software installed. Uh, this is this is another big one. Uh, you know, when it comes, especially we'll talk in a second about vulnerability management. Uh, you've got to know the entire scope uh, of what you have to protect, and and both and that really is wrapped up in these two first controls: the hardware and the software. Uh, they really represent what you, you got to know what you need to protect. You got to know, you know, what does the scope include? You know, what are all the vectors of attack? Uh, because if you don't know this, it's hard to create a good cybersecurity program that will encompass everything. It's no different than at your house. You know where all your windows, you know where all your doors are in your house. Uh, if you had a, you know, one of those two that you weren't aware of, uh, that ob obviously could represent, you know, a threat to the security of your house. It's no different with your network. Um, if you got devices that living on your network that you're not aware of or software that's installed on either your servers or your workstations you're not aware of and it's executing both of those, if you don't know they're there, then you can't uh, include them in your protection package. Yep. And, and the, soft, the software one's a little tricky. And we can it talk is. a little bit about that and see, the, you know, control number five. Uh, we can kind of talk. Yes, the configurations. Uh, so critical control three, continuous vulnerability management. Uh, you know, the fact that you must continuously acquire, assess, and take action on new information or identify vulnerabilities, remediate, and minimize the window of opportunity for attackers. So uh, there's several sources of vulnerabilities that we have out there that we see and get notified. I know I get notified every day of all these different vulnerabilities that are happening. We got we even got a Slack channel devoted just to uh, the CERT advisories that come out, um, and these have to be managed. They have to be. You have to keep an eye on things. Uh, um, they can be scary at first. I'm working with a client right now. We just went through their first round of vulnerability scans. You can be a little intimidating when when you look at those because you know it's pretty much been neglected for. Who knows how many years, and uh, we're we're working on getting those uh, resolved. At least the at least the big ones. Yeah. So, uh, patch releases, software bulletins, software updates, security advisors, threat bulletins. These are all different sources uh, that make or notifies or make us aware of vulnerabilities within uh, these different programs. And and then you really have where it diverges. You got the attackers. You know, they're looking to weaponize this information. So as soon as we know about it, uh, the attackers know about it as well. Absolutely. So as soon as that uh, patch is released, as soon as that notification, that CVE is published, we're racing uh, against time uh, to mitigate the risk of that or install that patch. So you really got uh, two groups of individuals uh, that are trying to race against the clock and really racing against each other uh, to try to, uh, you know, correct it. So the attackers, they're trying to weaponize it. Yep. Uh, they want to find a way to exploit that vulnerability. Uh, they'll use the information that's been released and they will uh, try to develop either some type of module, a program, or some type of angle to weaponize that. Uh, yep. So they can either compromise or exploit your systems. On the other end, you've got us. We're defenders. Uh, we're trying to mitigate the risk of it. We're trying to make sure that patch is downloaded. Uh, we're trying to make sure that that patch is installed, uh, you know, trying to be proactive. And that's so hard to do sometimes. Yep. Uh, on average, Lee, seven to 30 days. Sometimes less than that, I've heard. Not surprised. 
So uh, that's uh, one thing I even saw, I think, a publication this morning where you could even have a matter of hours, <laughs> depending on the vulnerability, uh, you know, before there's an exploit out there for that. So uh, I pulled this down uh, this morning and wanted to include that. But uh, June 2020, Microsoft released uh, their list of patches, 129 security vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, think everybody's got those covered right now? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and this is that that was the fourth month in a row. I, I wasn't able to pull July's yet, but the fourth month in a row, over 100 security flaws have been fixed. So I, I imagine, you know, er, that means 400 security flaws have been fixed. And it's up to you uh, to make sure that those flaws are patched. Uh, and not exploited. So, and, and part of that, and patch management is part of vulnerabilities uh, as well. So, uh, well, this is a, a big area. You bring up a good point. These vulnerabilities get discovered by the bad go up by got, bad guy and or the good guy. Regardless, they get discovered and they're there. Um, if you're running some end of life operating system or you know a, a piece of hardware that's you know just never gets patched, it's stagnant. They never release any firmware updates or anything like that. Uh, they're 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 really really vulnerable at that point in time. Yeah, absolutely. That was one that always shows up on our vulnerability scans. Uh, you know, is the software that's out of date that it's no longer being supported? That always shows up as a critical risk yeah. every there's, time, uh, just because of that. There's no such thing as like zero zero vulnerability. You know. There isn't system or something like that because they discover them every single day, and that's why you find so many. I mean, they're patching Windows Seven up until the day they, you know, hit end of life on it. So it just it never stops. It's not anything due to the the vendor or their mistakes, maybe a little bit, but uh, it's just a revolving door that never ends. Yeah, and and you know, some ways you can mitigate the risk of vulnerabilities. One is have a good patch management program. Make sure machines are kept up to date. Uh, with these latest patches, and it's not just the Windows patches. You you know, if you use Adobe, you got to patch Adobe. Yep. If you use Adobe Flash, you got to patch Adobe Flash. If you use Google Chrome, you got to patch Google Chrome. If you use uh -huh. you know any, if you use Zoom, <laughs> you've got to update your client. You've got to apply those updates. So That's right. uh, there's all types of of th this is a, a big vector uh, that you have to worry about because it's very broad because you think of every software you have installed in your program on your machine, your servers or used within your organization could have potential, uh, vulnerabilities that could be exploited. So, uh, this is a big one. Uh, it's also probably, I think one of the most difficult ones to manage, uh, in the top five, but it is a big one. And if you can get a handle on this, uh, and we'll talk about some ways to do that in a few minutes, but, uh, it can really help you out and go a long way, uh, to protect your organization. I'll tell you in, in, in the, uh, there's different classes and, and webinars I've attended. Vulnerabilities are always a big piece, uh, in the kill chain. Uh, you know, Hey, you want to recon, then we find what you have, and then we want to find what vulnerabilities exist within those systems. So these are always, uh, one area that, uh, you know, is always a go-to with that adversary to find out those vulnerabilities. All right, number four, let's talk about it. Uh, let's see, there we are. Controlled use of administrator privileges. Uh, this is probably one of the, the biggest ones we see out there, uh, either at the workstation level or elevation of privileges uh, through cracking a password, passing a hash on the administrative user. Lee, tell me a little bit about this and what do you think about this one? How important is this critical control? Uh, it's very important. Um, controlling administrator privileges can control a lot of things. Uh, I meant to reference uh, CIS control number four earlier when we were talking about uh, the software um, inventory. But, you know, having control over administrative access, let's just say on a PC level, will limit what they can do, uh, whether that be installing software whether that be running some kind of code or anything like that on their machine. Um, it's kind of a double-edged sword for a network admin because anytime they want to install something, the network admin is going to be running over there and have to throw credentials, elevated credentials at that. 
But uh, wow, you sure do reduce the amount of risk not giving the end user full control of, of a device. Yeah, it, it, if you have an adversary that can gain control uh, you know, of a device and have administrative privileges, then they own, own that device. Right. If they have a domain admin account, which if you're familiar with the Windows Active Directory, you know, that is the, the account that has all the privileges. It represents the king, uh, the keys to the kingdom. Right. Uh, having that type of level of access, they own your network at that point. Uh, you know, they can pretty much do whatever they want to do, whether install software, create their own user accounts, uh, you know, whatever they want to do, they can do it at that point. Uh, you know, some of the sub controls that I listed underneath this is one is maintaining inventory of administrative accounts. How many times Lee, have we done an assessment and seen just a laundry list of accounts in the administrative access? And, and why do you think that happens? Uh, I think it happens just for the ease of people really don't know what they're doing or what that privilege gives them, but they do know, Hey, this person can install some software when I give them those, you know, put them in this, uh, you know, domain admin group. Now they can install this software and I don't have to worry about it. It's just making yeah. their lives easier, but it's making the bad guys' lives easier also. That's right. I think a lot of it is you're right. It's about convenience. Yep. Uh, well, I don't know exactly what access this user is. So I'm just going to give them administrative access. Let's just That's get them right. all the access they need. That way, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about it. I can just, they, you know, I know if they give them administrative access, they can do whatever they need to do to do their job. So it really becomes a true convenience versus security uh, you know, challenge there. Uh, unique passwords. Uh, you know, we we recently did a security assessment, and as part of our assessments, we will actually export the hashes uh, of you know AD accounts, and we'll run them through a nice little website called CrackStation.net, and it will tell us if that hash has been uh, cracked or not. So, uh, in Windows Active Directory, your Windows username, of course, has a password attached to it. Uh, Windows stores that password in what's called a hash. It's just a long string of gnarly characters, uh, you know, 24 to 70, I can't remember the exact length of it, but there are programs out there that can turn that hash into, you know, a clear text password so you can find out what it is. So uh, it is always encouraged that you have unique passwords, number one, but also uh, those passwords follow some type of strong password policy. Uh, so we have found a lot of times passwords aren't as strong as you think they are, and they can be cracked. Uh, it takes time. Uh, it takes effort. It takes computing power. But over time, it can be done. So that is uh, one of the, the biggest reasons you want a unique password. Also changing default passwords. Now, Lee, we've <laughs> gone into these assessments, and we've been able to, to get into network devices, what, routers, firewalls. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it saved passwords. us from, from factory resetting a device, but yeah, we run across it all the time. Uh, printers, you know, network network appliances, switches, firewalls, like you mentioned. Uh, a lot of people just take them out of the box, plug them up, do the basic config on them, and let them go. Yeah, and you can go out to, uh, you know, if, if you have a Netgear router, network, Netgear firewall, or uh, ubiquity uh you know all these uh, manufacturers they publish the default creds yeah. online you can go right to the user manual and you can find these default creds so exactly. that's why it's important you need to change defaults uh going back to passwords uh you know pretty interesting i i get a uh the fbi puts out what they call a cyber shield it's really just an open source uh cyber news but it talks here this struck me as almost insane but one out of every 142 password is one, two, three, four, five, six. Can still, you believe that? They've been, still. They've been, they've been saying that for like the last 10 years and people haven't woke up. That's crazy. So, so when you think about password, and this is published July 1st, this is not an old piece of information. Uh, but you see, it says the most common 1,000 passwords cover 6% of all the passwords out there. Uh, so the average password length is nine and a half characters, uh, and, uh, only 12% of passwords contain special characters. So when you think about, you know, if you're a, an adversary, the odds are really sort of in your favor when it comes to, uh, cracking passwords or breaking passwords. So, uh, very important that you do have a strong password and please don't make it one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever it is. 
uh, that is uh, a bad, bad practice. Uh, you know, use a password manager. There's a lot of good ones out there. Create some unique passwords. Use the password generator. Be smart about your passwords. I can't really stress that enough, especially if you have administrator privileges like this control is here. Do not use a very short or unsecure password for an administrative account. Yeah. Uh, this is another one we see is the, uh, the use of dedicated administrator accounts. I've seen this be a, a, an attack vector more than once. Uh, you have the, the IT administrator, uh, you know, he uses his own personal account, his everyday account is also a domain admin account. Why is that a problem, Lee? Uh, just because he is vulnerable also, and you know, if you just willed in that power all day long, if he gets hit with something, they've got full reign to the network. Now, if he wasn't using it, you know, if he tried to do anything that required uh, those, you know, those kind of privileges, he would be prompt for those uh, credentials. Cold stop right there for the Absolutely. bad guy. So think about, I think our best example is what Office 365 with the global admin account yeah. versus a regular account. That is one, one thing we always recommend if you're using Office 365, make sure global admins have an account or credentials that are not attached to their normal email account. Yeah. Uh, more times than not, we have seen uh, if 365 is compromised, especially at that global admin level, it's the person, they're a global admin, they're using their everyday, and it's attached to an email account. Their email account gets compromised. The adversary has, you know, global admin access to the Office 365 tenant. They can do a lot of uh, very bad things with that type yeah. of people. Just say if you have to, you have control over it. If you're lucky enough to catch them, you probably have a big mess to clean up or a lot to yeah. check up on to make sure because – they can start forwarding anybody's email accounts or setting up mail flow rules. Uh, yeah, that, that could be really scary. Um, and finally, uh, the last two we have your MFA multi-factor authentication. Uh, you know, that's a, a big, uh, you know, a big feature that you can apply to administrative access that way. If, uh, whether on your domain, whether Office 365, whether you know some type of law and business program if you can attach multi-factor authentication to it uh you're going to help yourself out a whole lot that way if that account's compromised you have that second way to authenticate that will uh, help prevent uh, something from happening uh and then finally login alerts i uh, can't say enough about this this is always something we see within uh, our assessments that uh, proper logging, proper alerts are not in place to track administrative access or changes to administrative access right. or privileges. Uh, you need to have that in place. That way, uh, if you do have to go back and forensically look at what's going on or you think you do have a problem, you have a way to track it. So uh, any closing thoughts on this one, Lee? It's a big one. It's a big one. It's a tough one too. Uh, how long do you retain these logs? Where do you put them? Uh, you know, there's tools out there to do that. But without them, let's say you did get compromised, without having you know the appropriate audit logging or advanced logging turned on, you basically have no information other than that you've been you've been attacked. Um, so I know a lot of times when we go into that situation, we first thing you request is, hey, where are your logs at, so we can try to yeah. piece this together. And if they don't have them, it makes it very difficult. Yeah, a lot of times we get a blank stare, and, and that's uh, that's a <laughs> yeah. scary situation. Uh, when you're uh, do, you know, doing incident response on a, you know, either ransomware or a BEC attack. And, and a lot of times there are some logging turned on, but you generally have to go in and turn this stuff on. Uh, it's all there. You know, you have the ability within the Windows Active Directory to turn this on. It's not an add-on. It's included with the system, uh, that advanced audit logging uh, through group policy. Uh, last one, as far as the, the critical control number five, before we go into how to put these things in place, but secure configurations. Uh, this, this is another big one. Uh, you know, I think this is probably one of the, the, uh, one of the ones we find most common as well is just not having, uh, machines either left in some kind of default configuration. Uh, they're, uh, built for ease of deployment and ease of use, not, uh, security minded. And, and you have to avoid what I call the security decay after the initial configuration. So, so Lee, when you take a Dell computer out of the box, is it ready to go from a security standpoint? 
No, nah, there's typically what we refer to as a bunch of bloatware on there, you know, a bunch yeah. of free programs and stuff like that. We recommend you to uninstall those. And, and Active Directory group policies will be a big, uh, uh, big component in your corner to push down a lot of security policies. As soon as you add it to the domain, reboot that machine and log in, you know, you can have a, it locked down pretty well with a bunch of uh, group policies, password policy, screensaver policies, you know, you name it. Uh, group policy is your best friend uh, when it comes to trying to secure a machine or a bunch of machines at one time to follow your standards. Absolutely, I think one of the biggest thing is to set those standards. Hey. You know, when you when it comes to talking about local administrative access, who has that kind of access? When it talks about wireless configurations on your laptop, when you think about screen savers, when you think about applying uh, encryption, uh, you know, you need to have a great or a very good list of things you need to do to properly secure a device uh, out of the box. Uh, it is not just a process of take it out of the box and give it directly to the user. That's not something we'd recommend. Uh, make sure you go through that machine and you, you make sure it has all those configurations that it should have on it, uh, you know, that you have listed out or that you know about. Uh, this is something we always uh, talk to clients about after assessments. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we see either servers are not configured correctly or they don't have the security uh, controls they need in place. Same thing with laptops and mobile devices. I think one of the best things about this one, Lee, is generally you have all those options there. It's really just yeah. about turning them on. That's right. That's right. Uh, same with Office 365. All the security tools are there. You just got to yeah. turn them on and utilize them. Yeah, and I think we, we've seen that with the same thing with Amazon Web Services. If you're Absolutely. using AWS, yep. you're using Azure, or you're using any kind of cloud or hosted system like Office 365 as well, You know they give you the tools. They say, hey, here's how you configure it to be secure, but they do not turn those on for you. It is up to you or your service pro provider to turn on that information uh, to make sure your environment is secure. So uh, this is, to me, is one of the easiest ones. Uh, you know, it's yeah. one of the most important, but it's also one of the easiest ones because generally it's just about having a good checklist, about having some knowledge of what you need to, need to do on that machine and just how to deploy it and turning on uh, you know, and making sure that you have at least that good initial configuration uh, going out to that machine and then secure. And then, of course, you have to maintain it after that, uh, you know, to make sure the patches are installed and any other changes are built into uh, you know, your change management process. So, so that covers our top five controls, uh, you know, there as far as, you know, the top five things you can do to start uh, creating your own program within your organization. Uh, that will help you secure it. Now let's talk about how to get started. Uh, obviously, CIS control number one, inventory. Uh, you know, some things we use to, uh, you know, scan across the network to find out what devices are out there. Uh, I like Nmaps, a great one to use. Uh, Angry IP is the one I use. I know Lee, you like advanced IP scanners. So yeah. what these programs do is they, you actually put them on your machine, you put in your IP range, and this is more technical, but, and it goes out and just scans and see what's on your network. That's the, the great first step to, uh, to get an inventory of devices. Now, if you've got uh, an internal IT team, or maybe you have a managed service provider, you usually, or, or many times they have an agent installed in every machine. This is another good way to pull inventory of what you have out there. I know we use SolarWinds and Central Advocates, and it, it has the ability for us to pull inventory of devices that it finds and it discovers that we can uh, give the clients, but also use to help them become more secure. Uh, Define the software necessary to conduct operations in your business. Compare against the inventory and device. So I sort of went a little bit different on this as far as implementing it. Don't start with what's all on your machines. Start with what you need. Right. So start with, hey, what, what software do you have to have to run your business? Uh, what line of business software? What productivity software? Is it Office? Is it Excel? Is it Word? Outlook? All those are pretty standard. But, uh, you know, you don't need Adobe Flash installed on your server. Uh, you probably don't need Adobe Reader installed on your domain controller. Uh, you, there, are probably, there are a lot of programs you may not need to have installed on workstations. So define what you need by department or by 
you know, group or a functional group to see what you need installed there. And, and then yeah, compare it th against inventory and devices. I think each company needs to, to remember that these are corporate machines, not personal computers. Um, I know it's nice uh, and it's a, it's a benefit working for some companies, you know, be able to take a computer or a laptop home, but uh, you know, they got to find ways to respect the corporate policies and stuff like that to not install games or what so be it. Cause I know a lot of companies out there right now don't have any application control in place. It's really probably just written policies, maybe nothing at all, but um, just uh Keep in mind that these are corporate devices, and not you know personal machines. Yeah, I mean, even when it comes to browser extensions, you know, there's yeah, a lot of absolutely. nasty ones out there that will get you uh, in trouble. Uh, we see a lot of utilities. It's like these free utilities to download. A lot of times, they're not safe to download. Remember, remember wasn't it, wasn't it Weatherbug that every like millions oh and millions goodness, of people yes. downloaded that thing was just filthy. <laughs> and it, yeah, it was awful. What a terrible yeah. program. That was the big one. Everybody, everybody, everybody had that, and you'd run a malware scan, and it would just like light it up <laughs> yeah. uh, big time. So I mean, those are. I mean, you know, those are. are that's a, a a funny example, but that's just. Hey, people will install software, and it's and it's widely available. It's e easy to get to download dot com or software dot com, whatever you want it to be. Yeah. And uh, you know, you need you have a need. You go out there, you find you know some kind of a freeware uh, that may help you out, but you don't know exactly what comes with that freeware. Uh, same yeah. thing in your mobile device. I mean, you think of all the apps out there. Of course, there's the big. I talk about TikTok, uh, one of the social apps. You know, and, yeah. and and how bad it is, and and how it takes data and just streams it directly to, uh, you know, government servers overseas. Uh, so uh, we have to be really careful about what we need on our machines and mobile devices. But I think, hey, start with defining what you need. You know, don't don't just take what all is out there. Say, hey, we only need X, Y, and Z to run our business and start there and then move forward. That's right. Uh, you know, vulnerability scans. We talk. I know we do that for some clients. Uh, you know, at least quarterly, if you can do them sooner than that or more frequently, by all means, uh, you know, you, that will definitely help you out. Uh, there's a lot of paid or free scanners out there. I know we like Nessus is one. Uh, OpenVAS or OpenVAS is an open source scanner you can download for free. And uh, you can run on your environment if you want to. I think it comes out as an appliance or you can install it uh, on a Linux platform. Uh, or you can always hire an MSSP. That's, uh, that's what we do for our clients so we can manage vulnerabilities, uh, discover, manage, and help you uh, mitigate the risk of those vulnerabilities in our network as well. Uh, other ones here about, uh, you know, administrative control. Ask yourself, who needs to be an administrator? Uh, you know, I know we've got a lot of tech guys on our team, but not everybody is a domain admin, even within our own group. Uh, we have, have limited down to only a few of us have that type of access to our own network because I'll tell you as MSP we're in it we're a target just like any other company uh, avoid shared accounts uh, I've often seen that you'll have one you know the IT IT department you know they'll share one domain admin account you know company.admin whatever it may be and they'll use that always use that account to do admin access it's great they're using a separate account but I think you need to make sure it's not a shared account everyone should have their own domain admin account uh, don't What's yeah, that? I was going to say, even your receptionist, I see that one the most, you know, the receptionist. Yes. I'll log in with a receptionist account. Yeah. Uh, never use your normal everyday account. You know, you have a specific account to set up just for administrative privileges. Uh, always different user, different password. Right. Uh, you never want it to replicate that across these administrative accounts. Uh, also, consider removing local admin rights from local machines. I'm going to leave that one for you, man. You're a big proponent of that. Tell us why. Yeah, I am. Um, local administrative accounts, like I said, typically the password's not set to expire on those, and the bad guy's got time on his side. There's typically no lockout policy on the local accounts, so um, the local administrator account is called administrator, so the bad guy already knows yes, the user built in. Name. Yep, and so when he gets the password, uh, which is usually set up in a hurry, uh, when the machine's first configured, but um, as soon as he gets it, he's got full keys to that to that machine. Yeah, I mean, if they get if they pop that local admin account, you know, they have full access to do whatever they want to in the local machine. 
so that's that's always a, a a there there is a risk and reward to local admin local administrative rights keeping those in place or removing them. Uh, I know it's a, it's always a battle a lot of times with that one thing, but if you can find a way to remove those rights, keep the user productive, uh, you're going a long way to securing that workstation or endpoint. Uh, finally, uh, when it comes to configurations, take advantage of the tools and options you already own. Uh, you know, Windows Server, Active Directory, Group Policy, these are all part of the Windows, uh, you know, OS. Uh, they're all roles you can apply. Uh, they cost you nothing. You generally right. just have to turn them on. Uh, they're not silver bullets, but I'll tell you one thing. They can, by putting these in place, you know, in very deliberate, in a deliberate fashion, very planned fashion, God, you can do a lot to secure organization. Uh, you know, a lot of times we go to clients and, and see issues. We're like, hey, you just need to turn this on. You just need to configure it this, and they can do a lot to uh, yeah. secure the environment. Powerful, powerful tools. Absolutely. So hopefully these are some tips. you can, And all these apply to uh, the CIS controls we covered today, uh, whether controlling administrative access, secure configuration, inventorying your hardware and software. Uh, these are all some tips you can have for implementing those. Uh, we, like I said, we use the top 20 controls in our security risk assessments. Uh, you know, we look at, we have a rapid risk assessment. This is top 20. It, it touches all top 20, four to three sub controls and some other vulnerability scans along with it. So if you're interested in that, please let us know. We have a full security risk assessment, which is a lot more comprehensive. Uh, that we can do as well. And as always, uh, if you need to get in touch with us, this is our, our uh, go-to team here. You can get in touch with me via email, uh, Samantha or Caroline as well. Uh, you can always call us 205-443-5900 as well. But please stop by uh, our website, uh, follow us on social media, and uh, we can definitely uh, you know help you out. Any closing thoughts, Lee? Yeah, I would recommend that everybody go, if you're interested in the CIS controls, go to cisecurity.org and just read the top level 20 controls and ask yourself, are we remotely doing any of these? And I think you'll find yourself saying no. And I think you'll find yourself saying, hey, a lot of these are great ideas. We probably should be doing them. A lot of them are, are, are not hard to implement. So go look they at are. those. Just read them at a very high level and ask yourself, are we doing any of this? Yeah, I think the, the CIS to me, they're, they're a great foundational component to get started. A lot of clients, we, a lot of companies ask that question. We don't know how to get started, and, and this is a great way to get started. So uh, is by looking at these controls and putting in place. And like I said, just reading down and being familiar with them will probably generate some questions and hopefully generate some action on your part to, uh, you know, better secure your organization. Uh, Absolutely. I uh, did have a Q&A here. I did have a question come across. There'll be a class on the next five. Uh, we will consider that. Uh, we'll look at uh, look through those and may have a more comprehensive view uh, of the CIS controls because there there's only 20 of them out there. We start out with the top five, but we can absolutely go down uh, you know, the, the next five, and uh, maybe we'll do that in a future webinar or, or maybe just a, a, a YouTube a series maybe on just the top five controls and just put it out there for people to, to read and become more familiar with. There are actually some videos on the CIS website too uh, that cover these controls and uh, maybe we can uh, do uh, some information on those uh, in the future. So. All right, I don't see any more uh, questions, any more additional questions there. Thanks uh, for those who joined us. Uh, please uh, check out our website, follow us on social media. Uh, we try to put a lot of information out there for you and uh, try to uh, keep your, keep your uh, network safe. If there's anything we can do, we'd be sure to get in touch with us. So we're signing off for now. Thanks a lot.